One second. Welcome, everyone. Um, so today we have um, an exciting one. We have we're having a talk about barrel aging and barrel aged beers and all quite all that goodness. And if I can click this button here properly, we we'll get Chris up on screen as well. So we have with us we have um, Chris from Poyala, Yuri from Malaskowski, and David from Brussels Beer Project. So um, the usual thing where we're kind of broadcasting on two or three places here. So um, I don't know where anybody's watching, but if you're in here, you can um, join in, ask questions. There's the ability to kind of raise your hand there if you want to come up and join us and ask questions in person or anything like that. Um, other than that, just you know, just chat along and, and take notice and we'll see who comes in. Um, I'm just going to check that we're on live on the other one. We are. So everything's fine. Um, because technology confuses half the time it doesn't start at all. So um yeah, so we have barrel barrel aging, and this was uh Chris's suggestion. He kind of jumped at the idea of we should talk about barrels and that's it. And um so maybe we should start with you, Chris. Um you're in Estonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh warm sunny Estonia right now. Um we've been uh we've been open since uh in our own brewery since 2014, moved to a new one just uh, back in uh, back two years ago now and uh and yeah we've been we've been keeping busy in the lockdowns brewing a lot more barrel aged beer so <laughs> we like to do it anyway yeah i think again the feeling that breweries have been hit they've either closed down or else they've expanded a lot during the during the lockdowns they've gone one way or the other but no one stayed no one stayed constant yeah <laughs> um so yeah so you, you i mean you do a lot of the kind of IPAs and modern years, but you seem to have a huge focus on them. Um, you really like, personally, I think, that the barrel aged. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Barrel aging has always kind of been my passion ever since I got into craft beer. I'm from Scotland originally, so whiskey and that is, uh, has always been surrounding me, uh, to be honest. And just the romanticism of the, uh, the oak is always there. But there's just still so much untapped potential in, like, barrel aging beers. There's so much more interaction you can go forward with uh, with blending the flavors of spirits, blending the wine and uh, and flavors of different oak or different other woods, um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot going on there. So I've been very lucky that we've been able to push forward with that. We've been able to from from our first year already get into the barrel aging uh, program. Like one of our very first beers we ever brewed, uh, right out in uh, Pinot Noir barrels, uh, and that kind of set the tone for the rest of it. And now we're doing more than ever, and no one can get enough of it. To be honest, which is which is nice. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of freedom to do what we feel is like exciting for us in the world of barrel aging, not just like, not just to tick some pick a box, so to say. Yeah, is that how the the rest of you feel about it as well? I mean, is it a personal project that you you like barrels barrel aged? Um. Sorry. For them or uh, for, yeah, uh, for, for, for for them for Yuri or or David, is it like very personal that you want you know that you have the real interest in barrel aging personally, or is it that you see a market for it? Or well, uh, uh, when I uh, when I first uh, talked with Chris, Chris talked about his past, and I was like, what the hell is he talking about? Beer is uh, <laughs> not made for barrels. And then we started our own. We got some uh, Gognac barrels from France and started to uh, with, uh, with our Imperial. It, it came out really good. And uh, nowadays we do pills, some lagers in barrels. These haven't hit the market yet. But we are doing Imperial pills and we're expanding the re and I, I'm making now recipes ex uh, exclusive for the barley. So I've, I've I've been beaten by the passion which Chris had. <laughs> he talked talked about it to me. I was like, oh, okay, but now now I'm beaten. <laughs> so I mean, so actually, yeah. maybe in, in, in our case, in our case, it's a no, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, no, go on. Yeah, I, just, I was just uh, saying that in our case, it was is a bit different. A bit different. I don't know if you know uh, the the brew pub in, in, in the center of Brussels. Uh, we are quite limited in terms of space, so we don't have enough space to uh, to have a, a proper barrel age program. 
Uh, so we, we just do it because brewers, uh, me and my colleagues, we love uh, to have this uh, extra layer into our beers. Uh, it's something that is changing now because we got more space okay. and we are we are expanding our barrel program. It's still a work work in progress. But uh, so far, all of the all of the barrel aged beers we did was just a very limited amount, so very few barrels. Uh, we don't have you know, that much space, but always uh, trying to have a different uh, a different blend of flavors uh, into into the palate of our customers and into our com community. Uh, but uh, it's been a it's a small it's, it's been a small program, uh, but uh, very very interesting in in my opinion. Right. Well, maybe um, yeah. So look, let, let, let's maybe open one. So, who, Chris? Maybe again, because you started. Maybe, maybe we should um open one of yours. What do you, yeah, what, absolutely. What do you, what do you recommend? Because I don't think we're gonna. We were discussing this just before we went there. I don't think everybody's gonna get to drink everything today. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it'd be a very short day. Uh, Yuri might not catch much of that match then, <laughs> or remember it anyway. Um. I think uh, I think the ones I sent over were the the Pima Ur PX um, and uh, was it the UXO as well? Yeah. No, it was Fuero Breakfast, I think. Fuero Breakfast. Um, so I'd recommend start off with the uh, with the breakfast in that case. Breakfast, I suppose, has to be. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I actually tried this the other night. I don't know if you tried it yet. Um, I mean, the spiciness in it was. It was really nice thank you thank you it's um that's one that we're uh, we're pretty proud of it's uh it's kind of a little bit of a talk a little bit about that here it's a spiritual successor to one that we've released previously uh, which is a beer called cowboy breakfast we've done it twice now and it's uh it's always what we've imagined as like a wild west sort of stout you know, it's, uh, it's aged in bourbon it's with a couple of um couple of ingredients that we feel are kind of like wild westy, like campfire coffee, a little bit of smoke. So this time one of our brewers really wanted to revisit that, like, but go a little south of the border. So vaquero is effectively means like, uh, we see it as cowboy in, uh, in, uh, in Mexican. Um, and it's kind of a similar twist, but we're aging in this one. It's a different base beer and we're aging it in, uh, in tequila barrels as well as, uh, as well as bourbon. And we're throwing in a little bit of like just a touch of uh, a touch of cinnamon, Ceylon cinnamon, and uh, a little bit of ancho mulatto chili in there. And what's cool is like all of this really reinforces the uh, the uh, the barrel character. So a lot of the spiciness is all coming straight off of those barrels. Um, it's a very very minimal amount of agrams that have been added to this one, but uh, but yeah, it just kind of comes forward really nicely. And we re we really like. Um, we really like to play around with different types of sort of uh, barrel aging beers as well. You know, you've got the big, big, dark, sweet stuff, but it's good to also have like uh, a little bit of that spicy, like back to basics oak character as well. Um, that's what we think anyway. It's, it's a fun way to blend in other ingredients as well. So, so yeah, that's, that's what we get off of this one anyway. Mm. Anybody's opinion? Oh, it's oh, fantastic! It as soon as yeah. I opened it, it was like it was like a, a pop of uh, sweet and candy and uh, and uh, spices. It was wow, really nice. Mm. <laughs> and how is that a blender? Did you say or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this one, uh, this one is a blend. We've um, see what we've done. We're uh, we're very lucky to have the opposite. To, almost the opposite problem that uh, that yourselves have uh, in Brussels, David, where we've, uh, in our new brewery, in our last place, we were fighting for space for every single barrel we could get. And nowadays we are kind of doing the same after the last year in our new brewery. But uh, but one of the big things for us is we wanted to have a massive area just, just to store barrels. And that's not because, you know, having the most makes us the, the best, having the big barrel program makes us the best, but it means that we can, we can draw off of other ones, you know, like, one of uh, one of my good, very good friends in uh, in Italy, uh, uh, Danilo from uh, Del Ducato, he he kind of shapes a bit of my philosophy in barrel age beer. Where he said that like for them, it wasn't like malt, hops, yeast that were the ingredients, but it was the beers that are in barrels. And it doesn't matter what they were before because now those are just ingredients. You can start putting them together, like blending in one ridiculously smoky barrel uh, into I don't know five or six other barrels can be a really good effect. Uh, which, if you don't have space to make that one crazy barrel, you never get to experience some of this stuff. Before. 
So, uh, so yeah, this was a little yeah, bit of a yeah, blend the, of um, the adventures as well. Mm -hmm. okay, sorry, I was just 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 uh, compl completing what you you said. Like the advantage of having a beer, a beer, a bigger uh, spectrum of barrels, uh, it also makes uh, it gives you more opportunity to do different blends as well. You know, like the the blends can be you have way more opportunities to blend with different barrels, which because each barrel is unique and you have way more uh, small touches that you can give with uh, I don't know a barrel of tequila or a barrel barrel of bourbon. Uh, you can mm -hmm. actually put everything in the equation, which is. Uh, super a big uh, uh, choice uh, in your warehouse. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. It's like you need a bit more sweetness. Well, you know, okay, I have these three or four barrels here. I can put yeah. one of them in uh, and just add a little bit to it. It's, uh, it, it really gives you that freedom. It's crazy. Yeah. But, uh, that's, that's one luxury of, uh, of, of having a larger amount of barrels for us. Yeah. So, yeah, so barrel aging, I mean, the, the, this was something that came up there some time back with, with a couple of other ones I was talking about. And, that maybe blending is very underrated in beer. It, it's mm -hmm. you see it in lambics and that, but very underrated outside of it. And is it only in barrels that you really have that opportunity, or I suppose you can blend any beer, really, can't you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the the barrels just give you that extra taste or extra edge, is it? Yeah, and I think they also like those are beers that anyway are taking a long amount, a long time. We we have uh, like hand on the chest done one or two IPAs where we put in a little bit of this IPA with a little bit of this because we felt that it worked better as a one-off release with, with a little bit of that. But you kind of, you know, you don't really, you get a lot more time to play around with that and perfect it in the barrel-aged world. And the nuances come through a lot better, I think. But 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 blending for sure is uh, it's underrated. It's, there's a lot you can do with uh, a lot you can do with it. I mean, like I, know, I know a lot of people that um, that actually swear by barrel aging. They swear by adding just a touch of uh, beer to their uh, uh, to the final blend um, because they somehow feel that it makes it pop more like barrelly. It, it makes it taste more barrelly because it has that little touch of freshness uh, rather than uh, rather than that, which we've uh, like, I think is very very interesting. We've uh, we've we've only done it once. It's kind of an exciting idea. Um, well, actually, I, I have some yeah. experience on that uh, for the Kerberos, uh, mm -hmm, which we mm -hmm. might not taste today. <laughs> uh, we we uh, put some fresh, when we empty the barrel, we put fresh in it. Mm -hmm. This is actually, I think it really came out better than the first batch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some freshness and uh, I think it's a good way. Uh, we don't have the luxury every time to do that, but <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we had the fresh plants coming up, so we we used bit to the blend, and it came up really good. And what's the? Um, that's what I was going to ask. Is like when. Like I, I know very little about it. So when you're blending, when, when you're aging it in barrels, there's kind of what seems to me like there's two or three things you're trying to get at. Is it like you're trying to get the the wood element out of it, but you're also trying to get what was in the barrel before. So there's two kind of different different things you're trying to extract from the barrel. Is it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how do you how do you plan then which or is it, do you, do you try it and just see what happens? Or do you have a good idea when you're putting a beer into the barrel? What, you know, what's going to come out of that or how long? Yeah. How long? So for us, at this point, then we've got like a pretty good idea of many, many different works. But, uh, but we have a pretty good idea now what we're, you know, how long of a time it's going to take and what type of barrels are going to give you what. Because, I mean, you know, we all we all are guilty of just saying, you know, it's bourbon barrel aid. But of course, there's m just as many bourbon, so uh, you know that that makes a huge difference. It's many types of Scotch whiskey, types of mezcal, in rum is a massive difference. So uh, you know, we we kind of have like we have a preference of certain brands. Uh, we know for a uh, is going to give us that like little hint of spicy character. Uh, we know that uh, some of the Woodford Reserve is going to be massive vanilla in there, and that might way less time than uh, than other uh, other ones do. But uh, you also kind of have to balance that off if you're uh, with it, because 
you know, the intensity of the spirit can very often overtake the, uh, the beer itself. And what we're looking for is we're looking for like a balance between uh, between the beer and the oak, you know, because leaving something in a barrel for two years, well, depending on what that beer is, that might only taste of uh, whiskey or uh, or of bourbon after that. With uh, with gin barrels, then we found that like even just like two months was uh, more than enough for the beer that we had in there. Um, so uh, so yeah, it kind of it kind of has a lot of factors. And time, like time is one of them, but also also sort of temperature in that is another. Um, so I mean, we have uh, we have our barrel warehouse kept at a relatively constant temperature, but uh, but we know that if we wanted to extract more sort of oaky, woody characters, then we we'd cool that down from our existing uh, our existing temperature. At least that's how it works for us. Uh, yeah. And do the rest of you kind of plan out the same thing? Do you, like do you all sit down and plan out we're going to have it in this? you know this barrel thing and just produce it as barrels that you're then just going to blend with at the end of the day you're not really 100 percent sure what you're going to have or do you sit down with a with a clear idea of what's going to come out of this at the end of the day or what's you david is that what you do because you've got you've got the smaller uh, space do you it's really, it's it's really yeah. yeah i mean we are always limited because of the space indeed like when we have uh when we see that we have space for barrels or that we, we, we discarded a few barrels and we put in the planning another brew specifically for barrels. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, we end up blending different beers that we find very interesting uh, into, into these beers. Like uh, I think I, I sent you a Wilder Shout, which is a beer that was a blend of the Saison that we aged. Uh, and then we had a very good uh, 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 barrel with a um, pool of raspberries, which, which was like, like a base of a Berliner Weiss. And we, we thought it would be super nice to uh, insert it into the initially planned saison. Uh, it was supposed to be like just a blonde beer and like uh, and just this barrel full of raspberries that we had. Uh, it got into the blends and uh, it transformed the beer completely. Uh, so you really adapt because each barrel is unique and your 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 idea can also change depending on the taste that you are having uh, uh, barrel from barrel. Um, but as a, as a starting point. Always uh, with with one idea in my mind, you know. Okay, I, I want I want in uh, one year I want to have this flavor. I want to have this profile. I design I design the recipe. I order the barrels. Uh, I fill the barrels, and uh, my plan, uh, if there's no change in barrel or in my mind, uh, is that like uh, design, uh, fill the barrels, and hope for 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 have a nice beer in one year, six months, uh, two months, two years, whatever. So it's designed mm -hmm. from what, what's going to come out at the end of the day is going to come out of that barrel and it's going to be kind of the beer, primarily. Because I think yours were, yeah, were very yeah, blended. That, that's uh, my goal in the beginning, yeah, but... Tell me again. No, because I think like when I was looking at the labels on yours, like that, it definitely mentioned the blending in there. So I don't think there was any that was, you know, just 100% from one barrel, was there? Or am I getting confused? Uh, in your case, yeah, yeah, you have Imperial Stout that is 100% from uh, just one barrel, but you have uh, a Grey Pale, which is a blend of different barrels. Uh, you have the Wild Child, is also, also a blend of different barrels. And, and we, it's, it's something that we adapt according to our barrel uh, uh, park that we have uh, available. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, that's the same over there. And where do you... Sorry, let's just go back because we had another chance. Did you have you any other comment on the on the breakfast imperial breakfast there that that you just tried? Is there anything that came through on the second one that you thought that was definitely from the barrel? Any influence out of it? That you could mm. <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, that was definitely one where we like uh, we we kind of I don't want to say blended that on the fly. But, uh, but we had a uh, we had like a, a stock of ones that we thought, okay, this is going to go here, this is going to go here, this is going to go here. But like this is one of those situations where we um, we uh, were able to uh, uh, like put together most of the blend beforehand. But then like just before we took it out of the barrels, then we kind of tasted the whole thing and we thought we just kind of like thought, what if? Um, and uh, we actually were able to pop out some of the, uh, out those, uh, some of the bourbon just to let the just to let that spice character come through a little bit more. But the but the the smell as you're as you're taking them out was just just insane. 
those um those tequila barrels uh because you know they they were holding this beer for around about a year or so but what we found with tequila is like you know it can it kind of only starts to get like really really good after the first six months I and mean, we're thinking like maybe two years down the line because normally we don't second like we don't reuse barrels for a second time but with some some types of spirit like tequila then i reckon it will be longer but it'll again benefit but it'll like give even more um because we kind of got like a little bit of sweetness coming out of there that we we didn't actually predict from these tequila barrels we didn't think that was going to come from them it didn't like it wasn't quite what we were going for with a spicy character but like it kind of blended pretty well with with the, with the with that extra bourbon that we were able to um yeah it's it's a beer that kind of rekindled our love for tequila let's say that's that was our one of our big takeaways off of this beer actually because we've used mezcal in the past we've used uh, these the an ipa uh a white IPA, I think it was that we uh, that we pulled out of barrels and dry hops uh, post factum. Um, but this was the first time that we'd really used them in a stout, uh, and it was uh, it was cool to cool just to see how much their flavor came through on a dark beer. Still, so that's a very very wordy end, pretty much I suppose. But <laughs> long story short, tequila was good. We love we love tequila. <laughs> Okay, that's all we can take home today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting just listening because last week we had um, Neville Wild Ales and we had um, you know a couple of wild land and labour and that, and it was interesting that you know they come in and it's very much at the end blending. And Matthias was saying he doesn't really know what he's going to have to blend, so he, he can never predict what his final beer is. Mm -hmm. so it's, if it's much the same, it sounds mm -hmm. like it's really. Mm -hmm. really you have an idea but you don't it kind of is, like, for for us anyway sorry to cut you off there but for us it's definitely changed in those last like two years because beforehand beer uh, so we brew a single batch we'd put it into uh we put it into this type of barrel and it would come out at this time but like we've been trying to move move more forward to putting beers in barrels that we think will work looking for certain flavor profiles and then like that gives us much more freedom to say, you know, we have this idea. Here are the building blocks for it. But yeah, I, I think in a sense, it's kind of like we can almost make whatever we want out of the barrel stock that we have, which is which is pretty cool actually. So yeah, yeah I, I, get what, um, I get what he means with that. All right. Yeah, Kate here is just saying she's a, she likes dark beers and tequila, so I think she'd like this one. I think she'd be she'd definitely go out and look for it. <laughs> So um, awesome. yeah. So I don't know. Have, have the, do you want to another one, or do you want to slow down? Is it going too fast that, that we're all going to be dying? David or Yuri, do you want to? Well, I can, one of yours. We can take the Kronos. So this um, the uh, main idea for the beer beer before the barreling. Uh, the barley wine was so uh, often when you uh, drink barley wines, they uh, kind of look a little like damp. They're not fresh, so that's not place for the this barley wine. This is the zero uh, red active, which is uh, um, it's like caramel mouth, but it's the same. Uh, uh, Same uh, fermentation uh, properties that, uh, so it's a very good malt uh, and it gives lightness. It gives color, but, uh, dampness, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's quite light. And, it, and then a bit uh, golden ale. And, uh, uh, the barley wine uh, came out a bit strong, so it was well <laughs> point before. Uh, 12% <laughs> before the barrel, so this is 14. And and you can see how red it is. It is quite fresh. And this has mm -hmm, been mm -hmm. in uh, this has been in uh, Australian uh, dark uh, barrel. 
So the idea uh, at the beginning uh, for me was to uh, barley wine and, and rum. So this is the uh, result. For those of you at home, this is beautiful looking. Beautiful claret, beautiful light. Great right. Nice work, man. We make almost all of our other barrel uh, beers are so dark. So you can yeah. uh, see through them. And this is uh, this exactly yeah, exactly. How we to do it. <laughs> and this is the, this is a single barrel, is it? Yes, yes, this is a single barrel. Single barrel. All, all in uh, we got mm. some other yeah. barrels. Okay, really nice. We tried with Ecuadorian, but uh, they weren't that good. The, uh, actually, the first three barrels was Ecuadorian rum barrels, but uh, I wasn't so uh, pleased with that. So, luckily, we got some mm -hmm. Australian ones with dark rum. It, where do you get the barrels? Is there? I'm presuming there's some sort of a market secondary, like. There's a vendor in, in Finland who, who does uh, the searching thing for me. So. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I, I remember reading, I don't know, or hearing, I don't know, many, many years ago that I think at the time, maybe it was before kind of barrel aging was becoming popular here, but Irish distillers used to be the main, the, the biggest owner of sherry barrels or something in the world because they used to hmm. make them down to for the sherry and rent them out or just have controls over who could have them for 20 years and then they'd bring them back and make whiskey um so i was wondering so so like how did the barons go so if they like the the sherry makers have them the rum makers the whiskey they must go through like you know from being made for sherry to being for whiskey to yourselves or the, the some of those barons must go through a, a fair old journey yeah yeah I, I had some uh, barrels from uh, 65, 1965. And do you and do you get to track like uh, the whole history of what was in it at every stage, or do you just uh, actually I, I got them for free for free and they and they were unusable. They were so dried up. <laughs> 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 I, I, I took the head of it and I took my wall at my home. <laughs> and is there anything else left in the barrels? I suppose after that amount of time, it's not like a you know, like a lambic. Just to bring that up again, like where there's actually yeasts and any organisms, there must be nothing, nothing living in it. It's just you're just taking out the flavors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They. they well, they they have been normal bourbon or rum, so there's nothing living it in it. So we steam them first, and then carbon dioxide and then steam. Okay. The steaming is. Uh, I want to make sure that it won't leak because we have to have some that that leaves leaks because we have had some very old barrels to the brewery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's nice. That, that's nice. But I, actually, we were talking about the space. We we just had, uh, a bit over a year ago. We had a, a water storage, which is uh, this round space, which is storage storage food uh, water for. Uh, from the 1930s, and we got it for our uh, cold storage. Uh, the temperature goes uh, on winter time to one uh, degree Celsius, and on summer time it only goes to about 10, 12 degrees Celsius. So it's we 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 we've got some room, and it's it's kind of cold storage, but it's really we, we like it. It's continuous, uh, no big changes on the temperature. It's, for, for for us, it was really a lucky break that we got. So it's about uh, 200 square meters. So 
now we have some space mm -hmm. because uh, before and we had to like like david said there's a barrel there yeah 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 you end up dodging around and you get to the I know <laughs> I don't know any any brewery uh, that has too much space, except you, the, the Chris. Now <laughs> you wait till you come over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You'll hear me complaining about it again. Oh, you broke the pervert. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I suppose, Chris, what's your Having tasted this one, what do you think? I mean, and David? It's uh, the, the combo of that uh, caramelly rum is, uh, is really, really, uh, really, really well paired. Ridiculously decadent. And it adds almost like, uh, it adds almost like a, the, the dark rum is getting that like molasses y, salty, minerally character. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very complex, very, very nice. It's a shame it's only a single barrel in that sense. I wish, you, <laughs> wish you'd have more. But, uh, uh, no, it's a single bar barreling. We had, had like many barrels, seven or eight barrels. So. Mm. But, uh, actually, oh, okay. It has yes. some, uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite good, so, so there's not many bottles <laughs> left. <laughs> it has been interesting to see that this corona time, uh, we also have uh, have like the barrel aged stuff. It's it's selling really good. Mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. because people are tasting beers, they can taste the stronger beers at home. Yeah. They don't have to in in restaurant pay about twenty euros for a bottle. They can pay the seven That's euros and, and and taste it at home. I completely agree. Because I think people are like selling really good. Yeah. I think I've been hearing that a lot of people here as well. When, you know, a, lot, a lot of the, uh, sorry, a lot of the breweries here were surprising to me. They were on sale, you know, they were in the pubs and that, and it's really been a switch over to to selling at home. And people, I think it's done a lot for craft brewery actually the COVID thing because people are like you said, they're able to sit at home and try something rather than just be whatever it is in the pub. And I don't know if that's much the same in in Finland, but it's definitely the case here, like where we. You know, people in Ireland, same as in Scotland, go out to the pub to to socialise, and that's it. You know, and if the pub has something, you drink it, and if they don't, you, you try something else. It, it, actually, is there a what what size is the market for barrel aged beers? Is it? I mean, it must be pretty niche at the moment. Is it? If you your craft is kind of niche compared to the overall market. Mm, definitely compared definitely i mean i i'd say it can't be more than one percent of the whole craft beer market but yeah. at the same time it doesn't mean that it's super small it's like i'd say we're about five five ish five to ten percent of everything we do is uh is barrel aged um okay. like which which is which is already pretty pretty good i mean we're always amazed by just yeah. how big the demand is for them and like seeing seeing so many other people doing it as well it's uh it's certainly nothing that you're going to go to the pub uh, like regularly and have a, like have a glass of, but you know it's it's great as a gift. And the more and more people that get into craft beer, like they want these sort of things that like they can give as a nice nice present to someone who they know will appreciate it. Uh, I think like we, we actually sell, uh, we sell quite a bit of barrel aged beers over in uh, over in uh, uh, Asia, and like partly the uh, the wax cap is another thing there. They they keep on saying that like. A lot of people here they they give it as a like a, a gift as a token of respect to someone you know so it's yeah. much like whiskey they do the same uh, they, they do the same there the market for that is massive and kind of don't always know where it goes but uh, but it's, uh, it's 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 definitely bigger than we uh, we ever would have guessed the market for bar for barrel aged beer um, yeah yeah I, I I'm totally agreeing because uh, I've uh, talk to some people who are collecting our barrel eggs beers and uh, they are saving them for uh, a 50th anniversary or, or something like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or something like that mm -hmm. then when i when i turn 50 i'll i'll open uh, or not not 
not to call like 50 barrel aged beer and drink them on top of my birthday, but uh, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've been collecting them for a uh, for a celebration day or something like that. Yeah, actually, yeah. it's also it's also yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, go it's on, also David. very interesting. Uh, extra layer. Is, I think it's very interesting. The extra layer that these beers that we had tasted so far have is uh, the best before. is very uh, is very long term. You know, like you can age the beer and you can you can taste it uh, mm-hmm. uh, later on. And it's is is less of a worry for the brewer because you know that the beer will be in the shop and will be fine. You know, uh, there's no 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 need to push for the sales. There's people can store it at home. They can uh, age it themselves and they can uh, they can have it later on in a special occasion. So. Uh, a barrel aging a beer, like at least these ones that are so strong and so dense uh, with so much alcohol, uh, you will benefit from, from for age and people will, will, will appreciate it even more later on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which for us brewers, it's it's, uh, it's uh, safe and sound, you know, like uh, uh, yeah, yeah. beer is safe, uh, will age well, uh, no no issues yeah. with transports, no issues with sending a, a pallet yeah, yeah. to Asia and not knowing uh, <laughs> where it's being sold uh, or to, to the US, you know, like uh, we, are, we, we are way more uh, calm when the beer goes abroad, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. At least in my. That's true. Yeah, and so, yeah, it's there. I mean, is there, what's the oldest barrel aged beer in the world? What's that, what's that going for compared to, <laughs> say, ones? Is there a market for secondary market for it like that, or any auctioneering market yet? I think we've definitely seen that. Definitely, definitely see that with some of the some of the super rare lambics as well. So for for the, these sort of beers, probably just a matter of time. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember even like uh, maybe like seven eight years ago, uh, I had a I had a fairly decent collection of the old uh, the old Brood, Broodog Abstract series. Like their old barrel aged range, and when I was leaving the UK, I, uh, I sold most of them, and like pretty penny from uh, from what I'd paid for them. Actually, there was there was a big market already then for them. So, so I, I I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think more and more like some areas resemble the the high end spirit and uh, and wine trade, uh, which you know it's not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily, I think it's just how it is, but. Yeah, because there's some bad things of it, but but it definitely happens. So. Yeah, and it's also in Belgium as well. You know, like yeah, you know, like, uh, <laughs> as well with, of course, with, like uh, there's a there's a bit a uh, big a uh, small uh, leg. Sorry, uh, <laughs> um, I was just <laughs> mentioning that, uh, like Chris said, um, with the lambic market, it's it's crazy. The secondary market with the uh, U- U.S. brewers. Uh, with U.S. people, mm-hmm. um, but also like if you talk about these toys or uh, or these uh, breweries that do just the epic stuff. Uh, there's a, a big secondary market as well in Belgium uh, for for those beers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I noticed Paul here saying, uh, and this surprised me. He keeps doing barrel aged cans for special occasions. I, mm. do, you, do you keep any? Do you sell any of yours in cans? It seems to go against what you were saying there about the wax. Oh, and uh, the whole special occasion, really, doesn't it? Uh, we personally, we personally haven't. We only just got our canning line anyway last few months ago. Um, we we haven't. Uh, I per se don't have anything against barrel aged beer in cans. Uh, it doesn't go with the with our our sort of attitude because like we kind of we like to have them as an occasion. They're they're more of a special occasion, and there is a bit more of a sort of an element of fun and play to it there. You know, I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of people when they buy our barrel aged beers, they want to keep them for like for a bottle share with a friend. You know, maybe once or twice a month they'll go around and share some beers with friends. They, they will do the same. Um, but like, I don't see anything against uh, barrel aged beers and cans for sure. I, I think like so long as the can can keep uh, keep it tasting as tasting as well as as the bottle uh, with the liner and everything, then. You know, Evil Twin over in the U.S. is doing in these like tiny little. I think it's like two fifty mil cans or something. You guys may have seen them, and th- those are really fun. Those are really cute. But uh, I think we'll see more and more breweries doing that as well. There's more and more breweries are opening up with only the canning line. They don't have a bottling line, so it's either hand build one uh, or put it into cans. And generally, the choice for these type of beers, if, unless they're wild. Is, is it's going to age better than like going through 
back to mind. Um, so, yeah, no, yeah, it was but just, I, I, yeah, it was just the, the, the thing like you were saying, a special occasion, a can doesn't have the special occasion, but maybe as more breweries are, are getting into barrel age, then yeah, it's just, yeah, like you said, it, it's just practicalities. Comes. Well, uh, we do, we, we have canning line and bottling line, but uh, we do a bit of, uh, sorry, I didn't send you the uh, 0.75 uh, bottles, but uh, we, we do bigger bottles also. And we, mm. these are very special. We have some yes. Isle uh, single malt uh, casks, barrels that, uh, barrels that, uh, mm -hmm. that you might know which we can grant that which we can say. <laughs> uh, we did uh, <laughs> I think about seven uh, about seven hundred of them by beer gun. You know beer gun? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 because uh, I I think uh, I know that uh, uh, many brewers uh, take their uh, to the can. My personal uh, opinion is that uh, it should go on the bottle, but that's just just my personal opinion. No, like, like I said, if if you're keeping it for a special occasion, then yes, I think the, the bottles still do have something. Um, yeah, yeah. They just got that that, that feeling that it there's might not, something special. Not, it might not be a, ecological. I mean, we all know that can is more ecological. But, uh, but yeah, the, the big glass bottle or the small glass bottle, it's, it's more yeah. glass. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what's the market in Finland for it? It's like, I have no clue about the beer market in Finland at all. Like, is there many sold in shops or is it a lot of pub? Life or how, how, what, where's your main market in Finland? Sorry, uh, craft beer, beer or yeah, just, well, just for beer generally, and then for craft beer, is that sold differently? Or, uh, craft beer is about 5.6 percent of the total uh, volume of Finland, and last year was, and the big uh, okay. brewer is gone little down, and we little have gone. A little bit up, and uh, but the, the markets are the main uh, sales. Food restaurants are about ten to fifteen percent per year, and uh, of course there's alcohol, which is for the stronger players. Over five point five, uh, they sell quite a lot, uh, about ten to twenty percent of uh, craft beer. In Finland, in, okay. in Finnish, Finnish craft beer, but it's mostly through markets, of course, uh, and it's to five point five. Okay, so it's yeah, pretty much. And the the barrel uh, is in in Finland. It's quite young. We are one of the oldest, and uh, we have we have about sixty barrels now uh, coming up, and. Uh, I think we are one of the biggest, uh, if not the biggest one, in barrel aging programs. So, and that's sixty in kind of ready that you have filled at the moment that are in various. Yeah, in various stages. Okay. Uh, we have had some time because we haven't uh, done a lot about to the rest of us lately. <laughs> <laughs> David, how many did you say you have? Because I mean, your Brussels Beer Project, I suppose, are you know your yeah, the, your image is like lots of shaking up the the Belgian scene and lots of IPAs and modern beers. So how long? So how do you fit in that the uh, barrels? Yeah, I mean the barrels is more like a personal uh, is more like a personal uh, <laughs> push from from us from the brewers uh, just to have extra layer uh, of, of uh, complexity and then way extra layer for for to do some some uh, food pairing events or to do some uh, special events for the barrelage. It's not a big volume for for uh, for us. It's more like uh, more like very very niche, uh, way way less than what Chris was saying or what uh, Yidi was saying. Uh, it's less than one percent of what we brew. Um, 
we currently have something like 30 clean barrel aged beers uh, and we have around uh, 150 of mixed fermentation uh, right now uh, because the brewery that, that I am currently is, to, is um, uh, shifting towards mixed fermentation uh, and spiced beer uh, because we are in the process of, uh, of building a, uh, a production facility where I'm going to go. Um, but yeah, I mean, the barrel age will, will be still uh, always uh, uh, always in our hearts. We always will have a few barrels of it, but it will never be like uh, our main focus, you know. Uh, it will be IPAs, of course, still making the scene in Belgium, uh, still educating people about what the beer and oxidized beer is, because uh, people in, Bel in Belgium they still don't know what a good IPA that is not oxidized. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's our goal, you know, like keep educating people, keep uh, having some barrels here and there, uh, and the brewery that I'm currently in will shift completely to mixed fermentation. Uh, so we will be more and more as a, like you're mentioning, uh, like Neville, that you had a, 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 a tasting with them a few weeks ago. Uh, will be more, uh, the, the brewery where I am currently will be more like a, a mixed fermentation like Neville. Okay. And so which of your beers there do you think is worth the, the one to give a focus to? To the ones you you sent along, uh, uh, the are, menu. yeah, yeah. I would suggest I would suggest uh, let's reduce a bit the alcohol. Uh, <laughs> um, let's refresh our palates. Uh, it's all it's also one of the beers that we we do uh, every year, so we do a big batch per year. Uh, it's a great ale in barrels. Uh, it's a blend of barrels. So Pinard de Bruxelles, the big one that I sent you. Okay. okay. My, my waiter has passed out, so I, I need to check that. Yeah, but that might <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to apologize. So I this, don't this think is I a have that many. <laughs> no. I think, uh, really? I, 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 yeah, I, I definitely got it, but uh, I brought some of them over here, and that's not one of them. Sorry. <laughs> well, what, 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 do you, what do you have there, Chris? Uh, so I have, uh, amongst all of the cans, I've got the, uh, the BA Imperial Stout, the Ruby Port uh, barrel, um, and I've also got the uh, yeah. Minotaur, the, uh, the Imperial Red the, Ale. The big one or the small one? You got the 37 uh, the and a half or the 25? Yeah, 37.5. Yeah, let, let's do the Imperial Stout. Let's do the Imperial Stout, uh, yeah. which is also something that we're going to brew every year. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get it from my fridge as well. Sorry about that. Uh, Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> that was too many. <laughs> my hands were too full. <laughs> so we've been abandoned, Yuri. Yeah. Uh, so we take the Minotaur. Um, no, I think the <laughs> Imperial Stout. Yeah, we're gonna do the Imperial Stout lower in, in Auckland and yours, but uh, uh, it's something that we're gonna do uh, every year as well. And uh, also to talk about the importance of knowing uh, your barrel makers, uh, which is a case that, that we have here. Uh, so we have a very good relationship with the uh, JDS from Portugal, uh, which they are supplying uh, most of our uh, Portuguese barrels, uh, Port or Moscatel or something like that. Uh, and it's a, it's a it's a really nice old cooperage that uh, they they. They have done big, big jobs uh, in the US and uh, in Europe as well. Uh, and their, their, their port barrels are just uh, fantastic. So I think it's very interesting to, to put it in the, in the table. And is that, uh, I suppose I, I kind of touched on that. I mean, you know, because you have that relationship with them, you've got, you know the kind of the heritage of that barrel, where it's been and exactly what's been in it. Does that make a difference in kind of planning what you're going to put into it? Uh, it, it does. I mean, it's not not uh, like per se, but um, if you know the, if you know your barrel maker, if you know your your the people that are selling you the barrels in person, and if you see their barrel parts, uh, you kind of trust them. You know, they, you trust them that they, they'll just ship you just the best they have. Uh, and in this case, is what happens. So I, I'm original from Portugal, and I have a very very good relationship with the JDS from the north of Portugal. Uh, uh, and I, I just trust that they will send me all, always the best barrels they have. Uh, and I think okay. it's important, uh, especially when you have, I mean, is, you want to, to have the best product uh, possible, right? So in our case, we don't mind paying a bit more if 
if the barrel is better, you know, like uh, in, in, in our case, you know, like um, we always try to do. Yeah, one of the things I noticed, I mean, you touched on it there, was that there was a difference in the, the alcohol volume or ABV between yours. I mean, I think nearly all of yours, I didn't look at everything, but the, you were about 7 seven to eight percent, whereas um, Chris and Yuri's were all 14 percent. There was a fair old <laughs> difference in the alcohol in them. <laughs> is, that a, is that a cultural thing up? Up at the further north you go, that uh, I mean, the stronger. Or... A little bit colder. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Chris and in, uh, in Yiri, they are in, in countries where uh, they need to uh, warm themselves, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have to compete against the vodka market as well somehow. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I suppose Scotland is the same, but like in Ireland, you know, it's what the average kind of Heineken, the kind of four percent, would be the the average beers, and then we've. You go to you go to Belgium and you kind of fall over for the first day or two because it's seven or eight and it seems very strong, and then suddenly, <laughs> you know, you go to fourteen percent and it was it was a bit crazy because, yeah, I was just wondering because Arpus from uh, Latvia were on last two weeks ago and um, yeah they were all like triple IPA is ten percent there was nothing below ten percent and I was like whoa, yeah. yeah. Well, like I actually tell you one thing that in our in our instance uh, makes a bit of a difference is like we're a very small country. We're like 1.3 million people basically. So when craft beer is like five-ish percent of that market, it's a super tiny market. So we we end up sending like we've been exporting almost since day one, um, and we kind of find that like not only does it help keep the beer a little bit better, even though it's already already pretty good in double digits, but it's also it just like people don't seem to be too afraid because they know that they're buying like a bottle anyway to share with friends it's not like uh it's not like it's going to scare people off because they're already being scared by it being an imported craft beer etc uh, etc et but at least in our experience we, we think that way that's just a justification for ourselves <laughs> okay so uh, have you opened what have you opened yours up It's incredible. It's like super biscuity, vanilla, raisiny. I get a lot, a lot of like uh, dry cherries and figs and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's definitely a shift from the FVAB view that we, we are having. Uh, it's a bit more like uh, tuned down, a bit more dry as well. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm, but, uh, mm -hmm. for, I mean, uh, we are tasting it. I already know the beer. Uh, I, I happy, I'm happy to hear the feedback. Uh, but it's like I really like the uh, I really like the uh, oaky porty character of that, like the, that sort of woody tannins mixing with the dryness of it. I think that like that that that's not people aren't doing that enough to be honest. Yeah. But it's like it adds a lot of complexity to yeah. there. It's very very well. Sorry, that went over my head there. Um, mm. <laughs> the, like how what were we on about the, the mix of the tannins from the wood itself versus the versus the, the flavor coming out of the sherry, is it? Oh well David was just saying that like it's possibly a little like a little yeah. drier than the, pre the the previous ones we've had. And like I'm just saying that I, I really like that. I think that really highlights some things that we don't get to feel in when you're when you're clouding it with like higher residual sugars um, right. in some of the other some of the other ones. Yeah, I also have to say, David, like mad props and the barrels, they're absolutely beautiful. There, I love these 37.5s, they're gorgeous. Yeah, it's a good shift. Uh, we're, we're very we had some bad experience with the small uh, size, you know, because they are not punted, you know, like uh, the, the small yeah, size yeah. that we have, the 25, they are not punted. So sometimes we had like a few gushes in the beer because we have a lot of uh, uh, nucleation points by the east. Uh, so we had to shift mm -hmm. to the to these punted uh, beers, that, which now the beer is way more balanced, is more way more stable. 
um, and mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's less it's less uh, less work to bottle them, you know. Like uh, you have more volume. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. True, true. <laughs> Um, sorry, I'll just answer Kate here because she's asking, do you have tap rooms? I know, Chris, you do, and Brussels Beer Project have just bought a second second bar in um, in Brussels. Um, gee, um, and so, Yuri, do you have a tap room? Yeah, yeah, we do. And we okay. also have a, a couple of restaurants which have mainly our beers. Okay. And we have yeah. a... We we as a whole we started in the nineties in ninety eight so it's not called Tower Room yet it's <laughs> Beer House more of like <laughs> yeah but um Brussels Beer Project of you bought Michael Collins wasn't it in um yeah exactly it's the sorry speaker. Brian I know it's, uh, it's it was an Irish uh, Irish pub uh, yeah. we're gonna do our best to keep uh, a night nice out in there. <laughs> No, actually, uh, it's a uh, quite a while back now, but I used to live near there, so I used to I used to call in there a few times. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll do it. Yeah, do it was, proud. I mean, it was also it was also uh, yeah, it was a good opportunity for us because uh, unfortunately, COVID hit uh, Michael Collins and uh, we took the bar. Uh, they are just shifting to another bar. Uh, they have like Valeras. I don't know if you know. Uh, it's another bar in in Brussels. Uh, but yeah, we took over the the bar. Uh, hope hopefully, it will be uh, will be a success. Uh, and besides, we have also yeah. have two two tap rooms in Paris, uh, and uh, it's not like an, our tap room; it's more like a franchise in Tokyo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do they do they do you send them the beer, or do they brew locally as well, or do they brew to your beer, like the ones in Paris? And uh, we, we send everything in. Yeah, we we send everything in a refrigerated container. Okay. So there, Kate, you, you have lots of opportunities to, to go visit places once we're all traveling <laughs> again. And there, uh, is it, when, I guess uh, when, uh, when the world is normal again. Yeah. Well, vaccinations are on the way anyway. They're, they're getting there. Yeah, so so this is the Imperial South. So how do you decide what, what to put into a barrel? Are you just kind of, especially when Chris, you said that, you know, you want to use the barrel once. Are you taking a risk on what you're putting into it? What what will match, or just purely based on what you think was in it before, or and and then hoping that if it doesn't work out, you can blend it with something else later? Or, or... I think uh, I think you're always taking a risk, and it's like, but it's not always such a big risk because the end result like is generally going to be something to generally going to be something delicious anyway. If it can be used out like elsewhere sometimes but uh, but yeah i think that really comes into play when you're like uh when you have that close relationship as you say with the, with the barrel supplier it just gives you that much more you know you can like i think you can you can almost tell them what sort of beer you want to make and then they can help suggest it and that means that you then you don't have to be so bound you don't have to say okay i'm going to brew this then and i'll take whatever barrels are available it's more like you know you've talked it through and you know that these barrels will be available this time so you brew it according to that that schedule which which uh, as craft brewers we are all on pretty tight schedules i think so you know that helps that helps with that. um but yeah I, I think like i think it comes i think you definitely have to know what sort of the barrel was about beforehand because i mean there can be some nasty surprises like if you didn't know that the the whiskey the scotch whiskey barrel is heavily peated for example uh, and you're putting something in that just can't handle that that just can't support that level of peat then that can change your plans drastically um yeah. so so yeah i i'd say there is definitely an element of risk involved um but uh, it's hopefully a mitigated risk when you know what you're doing. What you're working with. I mean, it's again, you wouldn't work through like, just random grains or just a random hop that you get given. You'd want to know something about it. You'd want to have tasted, either tasted something brewed with it or, or made from it, or you would want to get some better idea of it before you use it. But that's my take, my take anyway. Is that well, your... at, well, at the beginning when uh, I started the uh, program, uh, I just uh, there wasn't much of vendors that sold barrels, so I, so I, I, I would take what I got, and uh, mm -hmm. then I got some red wine barrels, uh, which were 
which I uh, didn't uh, think through that I, I made uh, some uh, hasty recipe for barley also, so, and, I, and I put it on the red wine, and I, I thought that it would be a good idea, but uh, it wasn't. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, I, me personally, I, I've learned that it's a barrel and it's a few, uh, your own recipe that you can put there. They are the main things that you know what's you know what it's probably going to happen in a few months time mm -hmm, when you know mm -hmm. the barrel and you know your recipe you plant the whole thing knowledge is king in this also but you have to uh, i learned from this from my mistakes so I'm you're not you're... Right at, uh, that i can think so much far ahead i, I always have to make few mistakes before i get it right <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, that, that was one of the things um, Tom said that he can land the that it's all about it's almost cathartic like he's spending all his time in because he's also the head brewer in Galway Bay and he said it's all very scientific very much like you know measuring everything and getting it all right and this thing with land and labor which is all wild fermentation and it's all just about time and about taking it and it's it's kind of it's cathartic for him is that you know I suppose it's you're kind of sculpting something rather than going with a with a focus that you know this is what you're going to to brew is that i guess it's the same with barrel age because you're you're just seeing what comes out at the end mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think again you can uh, you can always taste throughout the process as well so the good thing about the the bad thing about barrel aging is it takes a long time to get results the good thing about it is if something isn't working out you have a long time to kind of uh, work out yeah, what your yeah. plan b <laughs> so swings and roundabouts <laughs> yeah yeah and do you yeah how, how did that work out and then on the time do you put it in a barrel knowing how long you're going to leave it there or is it all just tasting it as it goes along and then deciding it's ready it, de it de for us anyway it depends it's like we have for a certain type of barrel then we'll have a rough idea of how long it's going to take uh, so, for example, uh, white wine, we've worked with that very little, to be honest, only uh, Chardonnay and a few small, like, single barrel ones before. Um, so we're, we're releasing one in the next uh, the next month, which is a Champagne and Sauternes uh, barrel-aged one. So we kind of have, like, only the barest knowledge of how white wine works in that way, but it already helped us in the sense that we knew, okay, it's going to be a fairly, it can be a fairly light flavor, and it can be a fairly quick pickup on this type of oak. So we knew that we shouldn't be planning to put it in barrel like 12 months before we want to do it. It's more like maybe six to nine months before we want to release it. Uh, and, and then we were just able to sort of like, um, we're just able to sort of taste as it goes and, and see like, okay, after month three, is it where we'd expect it to be? Is it picking up any character at all? Because sometimes you just can't, you can't taste much after that. Um, and, you know, it's not just about, about adapting, like, just realizing, okay, well, this beer wants to take longer, so we give it longer. Or this beer is like it's, it's drying out the base beer a little uh, more than like we were planning on it. So we'll need to maybe think about brewing uh, another small batch of this at a higher gravity to uh, sort of blend back with that in different barrels. Yeah. But you, you you then have the time for it, so to say. Um, so uh, so yeah, we, we we do a lot of tasting. We taste every every single barrel before we release anything. Uh, because, you know, again, every single barrel is unique as well. So, you know, you can have like, you can have 20 barrels and 18 of them might be incredible. And two of them might be absolutely terrible. If you put those two in, suddenly you're bringing the whole thing down. Uh, you're like, diminishing everything. Likewise, you might have some barrels that are incredible and it's almost a waste to put them in with the rest of the beer because like, they just have so much more character that like you're losing that one specific barrels character by, by putting the rest of them yeah so. being there <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes when you we normally have we have about a thousand liter of uh, bat size so it's uh, about eight to ten uh, uh, barrels which we get well, normally eight or nine barrels per uh, if we're doing bourbon or something, but something like that, and then there's this one one barrel. Oh, fuck, this is uh, 
this is really good. This this rests are okay, but but this is really good. Why is this really good? Or why is that really bad? Why there's no taste in that? In that mm -hmm. You don't know. So this is where we've been on for an hour already. Um, so I know you you've got hockey to see you d despite your denial um, is there anything since we since we still have so many beers we really have to try before you before we kind of finish up or any any of the the great selections you had come on someone tell me one there that you really really wanted to try that you haven't tried yet no i mean he was the one that chris doesn't have <laughs> uh, Monday morning. That will be the, that will be my first one <laughs> for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> mm. You guys, anything? Uh, anything else? Anything to try? Um, well, Yuri's finishing off his other one, so... Oh, Yuri. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm starting to finish this off. So. We're going to watch a really small bit of the ice hockey the last, last uh, round of it. So. <laughs> Who, are you playing? Who are you playing in it? Germany. Okay. Piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's when I said that. It, it, it probably <laughs> moves, so. um, actually, yeah, so, so one question I had was uh, I mean, looking at some of those, like you, you released the or what you put into barrels sometimes is something just for the barrels, but a lot of the time it seems like it's you know something that you're also releasing separately. Um, yeah. Where do you make that decision? Like, when do you decide that this is a beer that I will, I, I can release as a barrel aged, or this is one that I should only release as a barrel aged, or how do you split that out? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, when we started the barrel aging program, uh, we had this one Imperial Rye, uh, which is Imperial Star, which was 7.4, so we knew that it was strong enough to, so we can use it as a test. So, naturally, it became our first barrel aging. Like I said, we had the, the Goliath barrels and the... Uh, uh, we had this product called Nemesis at the end of it, and uh, but then, uh, like for the Kerberos, uh, the the recipe, the beer was uh, especially made the barrels in mind. But then, uh, of course, the Imperial Rye, which we have uh, as a standard in in the brewery. We try to use with different barrels and test it out. And sometimes when you make a stronger beer, you want to test it out in the barrels also. We have a quite a few barrels coming up. <laughs> for uh, for us, we. Um, we have a couple of a couple of base beers that we do year round, the the, the Pinot, for example, and regular, uh, and uh, and those are just like we uh, we kind of we brew those ones for when when they go into barrels. We brew them like for the barrels in that sense. Like we we we've either got a hold on some some really really good ones that are going to come our way, and we think okay, this is a, this is a barrel that's really going to let this beer shine. So then we'll brew a batch up just just for that one uh, just for that one type of barrel or or a couple types of barrel depending on what we've, what we've got. Um, we uh, we almost never are brewing like a regular a regular beer and splitting it between splitting the same batch between barrel and uh, between package. Um, we've only done that maybe once or twice in uh, in our past. 
uh, like a non-barrel aged version and a reg and a barrel aged version coming later. Uh, it was fun, but it's uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a hassle sometimes, um, and you know inevitably people end up like you end up overshadowing the base beer uh, because like everyone is all about like, oh the barrel aged one is coming why 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 are we drinking the regular one? Um, but we'll you know so we'll plan that and that that's nice as well because sometimes even the base beers that you do they can benefit from like a few tweaks here and there uh, to uh, to help them like express the barrel character a little bit more um, so yeah that that's that's normally how we would how we would do it we 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 plan out specifically that this batch is going to put into barrels rather than like say okay we're not going to need this much bottles so we'll put some into barrels that's 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 how we do it anyway right. yeah what you know case is very similar yeah like we 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 did that sporadically. I'm thinking now about a few collabs we have done in the past. That the original collaboration was so good that we we thought this this beer will beneficiate a lot with the X or Y or Z barrel, and we did it a few times. Uh, but uh, um, in general, we 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 specifically designed for just for barrels or just for for a normal or normal beer. Uh, but yeah, but it's like Chris said, you know, like uh, sometimes. Uh, the beer turned out fantastic and you can really uh, put your thoughts together like uh, this barrel like this bourbon barrel or this uh, this uh, wine uh, white wine barrel will uh, uh, really give a, a really nice layer to the, to the base beer uh, and we have done that I think we did with uh, the Molen we have like a white imperial stout that we put in, bur in bourbon barrels later on and we did that with the Laugar as well with the salted caramel uh, imperial stout that we put it in bourbon as well and it turned out Great. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a few cases that we, we have done. Mm -hmm. Sounds very nice. Yeah, that one sounded nice enough to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I don't know, like, since you don't seem to be able to pick another beer that you want to try, maybe we um, maybe we should head towards finishing up before you don't fall over instead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe finish up more of this uh, Kronos from uh, Yuri. That'll definitely make us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 14%. It's the 14% the yeah. ones that will kill you. But 7 percent's not anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I'm trying to think now if there's anything else, if anybody has any questions, if there was any, anything, because I, I think it's a fascinating subject, just how, yeah, how it's taking off and how, you know, just, just what you're trying to get out of the barrels kind of it gives it that like i said i mean it's obvious it gives that a added complexity but it's interesting that it just gives you that as an extra tool to play with an extra thing mm -hmm. to just sculpt and and kind of be more kind of reactive i guess are you you're kind of more reacting to what you have rather than like i said sitting down to design what a final beer will be it's kind of more mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sort of thing um, well, but that's that's something I'm fascinated about. Um, and blending, yeah, Bl blending obviously, like I said, is another another thing that I'd only really considered from the lambic side. And it's interesting that you're all kind of blending the beers at the end. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't have any more questions. If anybody has any questions, or you would, or if you want to open another bottle, um, we, we can fire away for another while. <laughs> nope, I think that's. I think Thank that's you very it. much, and I hope, hope to see you live somewhere. Yeah. Very soon. <laughs> Hopefully we all will. Um, so listen, thanks, guys. Um, if you've, if nobody else has any questions, anything, I'll just... Um, one second, someone's saying something here. Yep, they're all thanking you. Um, so, yep. yeah, check out their beers. I mean, the, the ones I've tried here, I can guarantee, definitely worth definitely worth tasting, all, all of them, and uh, they have a whole range of extra ones there's a lot to experiment and to, to discover there um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to play out a little video to say bye bye um and just who we have next week so we've got um doc from ghent sakishkas from lithuania and brower stu mosto from poland so um should be a should be an interesting chat as well um some interesting brewers there i don't know if you well chris you might know sakishkas all right they're your next door neighbors there but actually poland probably mm -hmm. as well um, so they're, they're yeah, all they're all. 
Um, so, listen, thanks, guys. I'm, I've, I've held you for long enough at an hour and a quarter already. I'm just going to play this video and um, say if you want to hold on there. Okay, Sorry, I interrupted there. So it was a pleasure. And um, thanks a million for all your time and for just, just for taking the time to have a chat. And hopefully everybody else found it as, um, as interesting as I did. So I'm just going to play next week's if you want to stay around.